product owner is the strategic driving force of the product. When you think about the creation of a product, a strategy should be in place before you move into developing. It's product management is what it is. It should be a core part of product management. Scrum says you need a product backlog and a product goal, right? But these things don't grow on trees. Most of the product owners that, that we teach do not really have ownership of the business model. You will need to decide where you're playing and how you're winning and who your competitors are. The more context they understand of the customer, the more they can make great decisions on their own. You should absolutely understand what the business strategy is because your product strategy will have to be aligned with it because strategy isn't about getting data about the past. It's about envisaging what could be in the future. People also need to have the courage to take those decisions because you can have both organization clarity and technical competence. But if you're not courageous enough or if you're afraid of making these mistakes, you don't take decisions and then nothing moves forward. Welcome everyone. This is our next episode of the Agile Insights Conversation Series. Today I'm uh, joined by a friend and colleague, Karim Harbert. And Karim and I will have a conversation about the topic of product strategy. He was recently at the Global Scrum Gathering. He gave two talks, I think, about this topic, or maybe one about this topic, one about the other one. That's But right. before we get there and talk about the topic of product strategy, Karim, A, welcome to the show, and B, I'd like to give you some time and space to properly introduce yourself so that our yeah. viewers get to know you as well. Yeah, no, sure. Thanks, Sora. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to have this conversation. Um, uh, so I'm Karim, um, and uh, I am uh, an agile coach and trainer. So uh, I was a software engineer, I was a project manager, I was a scrum master. For many years now, I've been I've been coaching executives and training, and I'm, I'm a CST and a, and a Cal educator. And, um, and also the, uh, the the author of uh, the six enablers of business agility, where I uh, you know, talk about how how leaders can really create the environment for business agility for innovation. That's my passion. I love those two things: business agility and innovation. Um, uh, and strategy fits so beautifully into into both of those things, which is why we're going to talk about it today. Yeah. So um, I think for me, always business agility and innovation they're so closely connected. You you can't yeah. even separate them because. You need uh, innovation to have business agility, and then uh, a lot of the other things uh, just follow. Now, you decided to give this talk at the Global Scrum Gathering, and I wasn't there, so I haven't heard it. I'm diving into this topic with you for the first time. First of all, why did you decide to specifically talk about this topic? What kind of gap were you seeing maybe in the work with your clients, but also in the general agile community? Yeah, and, and and specifically on my product owner classes, right? My CSPO. Yeah. Um, so, what, for me, the the product owner is the strategic driving force of the product, right? You, you really should be making these decisions about product market fit, about you know, the product, the value proposition, the business model, the strategy. And you know, when I was, I've been on the, around in the agile space for many years, and I've been teaching that class for many years, and What I've heard is we, we talk about product strategy, but, but we almost never um, seem to talk about competitive strategy in the way that you would, you know, you've done an MBA and in the way that I did on my master's in innovation and entrepreneurship, going into, you know, diving back into the work of, uh, of Michael Porter um, and, and, and of your, your you know, person who's been on this show a couple of times, Roger Martin, um, you know, and, and, and his, his work about business strategy, competitive strategy, and how we combine that with product ownership and product management to build great products. I feel like it's something that the agile space and the scrum space doesn't talk about anywhere near enough. We talk a little bit about strategy, but not really competitive strategy. So I wanted to, hey, so here are some tools that I found useful and, and bring them to the community. And, and the feedback I got was that these are really great tools and most people hadn't seen them before. So I'm, I'm really quite glad I did that. Yeah. Now, I understand this because when I run my own product owner courses, and I've now done this for several years where I connected a lot of the elements that I learned also being a strategizer, coach, and advisor, and brought those things in, like a business model canvas, et cetera. Still, the topic of strategy in, in itself, right, especially connecting a product strategy ultimately with a business strategy, which is the company strategy, unless you're a startup where both of those things probably at the beginning are the same thing. Is something that um, that is missing is when you when we talk about product owner or product manager um, education or enablement, 
at which stage of a product owner's journey would you position the topic of product strategy before we dive a bit deeper into understanding yeah. what it really is and so on and so forth? Yeah, so for me, it's not a one-time thing. You, know, you will revisit it. I mean, it's not something you revisit every week, right? You revisit it maybe every year or a couple of years, but um, your uh, early on is the answer. So maybe you have identified the customers you will serve, which I guess is, is part of strategy, right? That's your way to play. Um, and maybe you've understood their needs and maybe you've found their unmet needs and you've created and validated a, a, a product using MVPs and all of these things that might serve those needs. You're putting the business model together. At some point, you have to think, well, what's already out there? Who's playing in the space we're going to play in? And either you choose to play in a different space or you choose to play in a similar space, but you you do it in a way such that you believe you can win in that space. And it's that, that gap there when you largely understand your product and business model, but you haven't yet started building it. It's like, well, well, how are we going to win in this place that we've decided we're going to play? Um, um, because... You know, if you don't have a reason, if you can't articulate why you believe your products and services either superior or significantly cheaper, then you know, how on earth do you communicate that to your customers? So early on, it's part marketing, part innovation, part product management, and it all comes together quite nicely. Yeah. Now, so uh, I agree with all of that, right? When you think about the creation of a product, a strategy should be in place before you move into developing the product itself. Yeah. Now, the initial question that I had that I had brought up, and maybe I didn't phrase it well, was at what point of the product owner development journey? So a person that is going to be a product owner, we would That's want right. to position this topic for them to learn. But to some extent, you also gave the answer because if you have to think about product strategy and formulate a strategy, that early in the creation of a product, obviously the person being in charge of the product, owning the product, which is the product owner, should also have the capabilities to do that strategy. So it wouldn't yeah. be a topic for some kind of advanced class where the people after two, three, four years of product ownership would now learn about strategy and then suddenly they're like, Oh man, I've built this thing and now we have to completely re revisit this because this is such a fundamental thing. Although it's a bit more complicated than maybe many of the other topics, but it's so fundamental in the early processes of creating a product that you would also position it early on. 100%. It's, it's in my, my most basic product in the class, which is the CSPO. Um, for a quick, quick example, right? But how, how do you make decisions if you don't know what your strategy is? Like for for example, Apple maintains its own operating system for its phones, right? It does that because it's pursuing a, a strategy of differentiation. That is, I'm going to be different in a way that is better, and that people will pay more for my product for this product here, right? Um, now, if it didn't know that, how would it make that decision? Like, because some people, and it's a perfectly valid strategy, they they want to do things in the cheapest possible way because they compete on cost leadership. But if you don't know which one you're choosing, and even if you do, you don't know what your sources of competitive advantage are, then, then decision-making, prioritization of a backlog, anything you do is just incoherent, right? So it's, it's something that has to be in place, which means product owners need to understand this right at the start of their journey up with the rest of the product. It's product management is what it is. It should be a core part of product management for sure. It just isn't really at the moment, unfortunately. It just, yeah, it just isn't. And I mean, one of the things is uh, the concept of strategy is not at all mentioned in one of the most relevant and popular frameworks, like such as Scrum, right? Yeah. In the 2020 update, I think for the first time, they mentioned the concept of a product goal. Prior to that, all of, our, all of us or most of us were talking about product vision, which was not even mentioned in Scrum. Now, where would you make the distinction between a product strategy and a product goal, which is mentioned in the framework? Yeah, that's a good question. I like the addition of a product goal. We, we always used to talk about the product vision in Scrum, but although it wasn't really part of Scrum. Now they've, they've largely formalized it. You know, product goal is what are we trying to achieve with this product? And like, what positive change are we trying to bring about for our customers, for our business, for the society as a whole, for the planet, for whatever it is, um, which is fine, but strategy bridges the gap 
between that and how are we going to do that? Right? Because it's like, all right, I want to, and, we, and this is partly my, my problem with OKRs. It's like we can have all these objectives and key results, which is basically things we would love to be true, right? right? We want to increase net promoter score to, from this to this. We want to increase revenue from this to this. It's like, yeah, and I want to win the lottery, but I don't have a systematic way of doing that. So the goal in itself is a good start. But if you don't know how you're going to do that um, in a coherent way, which is really what strategy is, like where are we going to play, how are we going to win, to quote Roger Martin's strategy cascade, then those goals aren't ever going to, to be realized. So for me, strategy is a way you realize your product goal. Yeah. So you would always, again, go product goal first and then think about how are we going to realize this? Yeah. And you know, then, add, let me add to that. Sorry to jump in again. Sorry. Yeah, but, for me, like I say to my, my, the people in my classes, hey, hey, Scrum says you need a product backlog and a product goal, right? But these things don't grow on trees, right? It's not like, oh, there's a product backlog. We've got it. Like the first kind of maybe even three quarters of day one for me is understanding your customers, understanding your market. How do you create a product market fit with lean startup and design thinking and business model canvas? And hey, you need to do all that to make sure you're building the right product before you even start with Scrum. So this is this is even before you even get into Scrum. And then, of course, this on product discovery and strategy is an ongoing thing, right? So this is a bit of Scrum that I know why it's not there, because you, you can use many techniques. But it, it, just because it's not there, it doesn't mean it should be ignored, right? It really shouldn't. It's incredibly important. Absolutely. For me, it's also, right? when, I, when I teach my product owner course, out of the three days that I teach, like half a day is about Scrum. The other two and a half days are all of those techniques that you mentioned, right? Starting out, <coughs> sorry, with design thinking and different approaches to understanding your customer, such as empathy map canvas, personas, all of those things. Now, when, when we talk about this and how we like, I mean, you teach a lot of product owners. I teach a lot of product owners. And my sense is, and maybe you can second that, that most of the product owners that, that we teach do not really have ownership of the business model. No, I don't. Right? And based on that, I would also like question to what extent they would own the product strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's not the product owners, at least how most organizations live that, right? Not how Scrum intends it to be, but yeah. how most organizations live that. If it's not the product owners owning the business model and the product strategy, who in the organization would you see owning that, being responsible for that, and ultimately asking to create something like that? Yeah. Well, in, in the sad truth is for lots of organizations and lots of products, they don't have a coherent strategy, right? It's not, and lots of organizations, right? It's like, obviously you always have a strategy because what you do is your strategy ultimately, but it's not consciously chosen like your your culture you always have a culture but it's not consciously chosen so you can just ignore it and the one one evolves right and it might be right and it might not it probably won't but and it's the same it's like hey we're doing this and it's you're making decisions but there, there's no overarching guiding framework to the decisions you make so we do these features or we do these features or we target these people it's like it's not that systematic so in some organizations they don't really consciously make those tough choices about about um, about the product, but in, in other organisations they do, but it's done above the product owner's head, which to me says that they're not really product owners. Now, increasingly, we're seeing product owners that report to product managers. It's like, well, then you're not the product owner because the product manager is the product owner in Scrum, right? It's the it's for me that's the, when you're a product manager in a Scrum context, the hat you wear is the product owner hat in Scrum. You're still a product manager. It's just on the Scrum team, you serve as the product owner. That's very much my interpretation of it. If you are a product owner and you report to a product manager, then you're a backlog manager, right? That's really what you are. Um, you're prioritizing a backlog someone else has created and validated based on the business model and the, the, the strategy they've created. So sometimes we see product managers, sometimes we see just other leaders in the organization dictating to the product owner what to deliver. And... Um, it's, it largely um, makes a bit of a mockery of the product owner role, in my in my uh, opinion. Um, and I, I try my bit, I do my little bit to try and um, reverse that in my classes and in my talks. Um, but whoever's doing it, it's the same process, right? I just, I wish more product owners were empowered to do it. 
Yeah. And I mean, one of the things that uh, I fully agree with you on that, right? One of the things that I see after I share these perspectives with the product owners that come to my classes is, hey, you ultimately need to take over these things because if you don't own these things, how are you going to make good prioritization decisions? Yeah. They immediately realize, okay, we can't really do that, right? We can make decisions based on technical dependencies, but that's not like value creation towards customers yeah. or, or, or not the best way to create value towards customers. And then they realize that over time, they probably need to like take more and more ownership or, or ask for more and more ownership. One of the things that I asked them to do is independent from whether you are responsible for having a business model or a business plan or whatever, go and create one. Yeah. Because you're demonstrating that you can create one results in more trust on the people above you uh, to, towards your skill set and ultimately them giving you the responsibility that you're asking for. It also gives you more cl clarity on what are the missing pieces that you currently don't see in terms of the products that you are or the, the one product that you're responsible for. Now, how do you help organizations beyond your, your classes and the work that you do there in setting good product strategies? And who would you bring into doing this collaboratively? Yeah. So the way I, again, defining product strategy is an interesting one because, you, you know, you say how, how the product strategy fits in with the business strategy, right? But, but actually business strategy is, is largely thought of that we've got corporate strategy, which is what businesses are we in? That's Meta owning Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram and, and Oculus and various other things, right? That's, that's the level higher than I'm talking about. Then you've got business strategy, which is, you know, where are we playing and how are we winning against the others people playing in that space? Then, then you've got functional strategy, IT strategy, finance strategy and all sorts, right? For me, product strategy sits in with that business strategy because for every product and service you have, you will need to decide where you're playing and how you're winning and who your competitors are. So it's, it's that level of analysis that you have to do. So anyone who is involved in business strategy, you should absolutely understand what the business strategy is because your product strategy will have to be aligned with it. So if Apple released a new product, it wouldn't want to do something that's significantly cheaper, but less good than every, because it, because it's, its business strategy is to not do that, right? It's to be the best and, and, and therefore people pay more for it. So you can't be incoherent with your business strategy. You have to be aligned. So understanding the business strategy, working with those senior leaders who created it is vital, but then you have your own decisions to make about your product and what your sources of competitive advantage are. And, and, and that's marketing and that's, user user experience, that's a product design, that's senior business people in the organization, that's product management, that's executives, that's all of these people who have this skill set that can help you make these strong decisions and test as well your strategy to make sure that it's the right strategy. So it's massively collaborative. Like in an organization, you have the whole C-suite led by the CEO and supported by the board of directors. And ultimately- Sometimes external consultants. Yeah, and consultants, right? <laughs> Indeed. Well, I mean, you've done that, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? But I mean, in an ideal world, you wouldn't need consultants to help you do it. Yeah. You would do it within the organization. And so maybe you do need some consultants, but may, but ultimately, it's, it's a team sport. It's not something you disappear off in the silo as a product owner and do on your own. Absolutely not. Just like product discovery and, and, and just like product market fit and, and, and design thinking is a collaborative game. Yeah. Now, you brought up an interesting point, and I recently gave a talk at a, at a local conference here in Cologne about the product owner, like needing all the others to succeed. Yeah. And I used this quote that is out there, right? You need, you need a village to raise a kid. And I said, as, as a product owner, right, you need this village to raise your product. You yeah. need marketing. You need uh, controlling. You need sales. You need engineering. You need... You need all of those. So one of the key skills that you have to build up as a product owner is to really be a good collaborator yeah. yourself. Now, if we think about what is taught in those product owner classes, we already identified a gap in the space of 
product strategy, uh, lean startup, like empathy mapping, business modeling, and all of those things. Because Scrum as a framework doesn't describe those things. But I also see very little in terms of collaboration skills <laughs> that people get to learn. Yeah. I see very seldom that a product owner also not only gets chosen based on their domain expertise, but also based on their expertise to bring various people, not only the stakeholders, like, but also others that can contribute to this together and ultimately create a strong group of people, not only their scrum team to, to build this. Do you address this in your courses? And if yes, how? Not the how. All right, so we, we're not necessarily, <laughs> hey, I've already got about another 10 things I would love to put in my, in my CSPO. And mine is only two days, yours is three days, right? Uh, uh, so I do one exercise at the end where um, we're talking about sort of the day-to-day -day activities of a product, I call it the perfect product owner, assuming there was such a thing. And, um, and then the last, the very last thing I do, I just, I get people to brainstorm the personality traits, you know, the, the, the soft skills, if you want to call it that, that you that they think it would take to be a great product owner and, uh, and and they always say collaborative they say inspiring they say great communicator right diplomatic the ability to say no to people and still have them like you right and um, they say all of these things that, that it takes to be a great product owner that, that we don't address on the class because it's, i'd love to but it's just i think we don't have the time um um, and, and, and so they all know the skills that you need, right? They, they understand intuitively, and I haven't even told them at this point, this is them coming up with it. Um, but no, I don't, uh, I don't address how to do those things and how to be those things. Um, that's something we, we actually spend a lot more time actually with Scrum Masters, right? Because Scrum Masters are, are known for that. Um, but for in the product owner space, it's very much a product focus, and my class is just as guilty of that as any of the others. Um, I wonder if you touch on it in yours. No, not, not really, not really. On, on on the collaboration piece. I mean, so what I do share is, if we look at the various tools that we use, starting with um, empathy mapping, so understanding your yeah. customer, I always emphasize that you can do this in a collaborative manner. Yeah. So the expectation wouldn't be, or I as a product owner wouldn't be doing this all by myself. I would at least include my team, right? The developers, because them getting a deep understanding of who the customer is, what problem we're trying to solve and so on and so forth is of great benefit. Yeah. I would also try to include my main stakeholders, right? And do the same with product vision or product goal. Do the same with business models. So all of those tools, and that's the beauty of the tools, they're so visual yeah. and they can be very collaborative and they can support yeah. collaboration. Yeah. What I also that's mention is, hey, have your Scrum Master facilitate these sessions so that you as a product owner can contribute on the content Yes. Therefore, it is important that the Scrum Master is also familiar with all of these tools. I always recommend to Scrum Masters to also take a product owner course, not the other way around, because yeah. I think a product owner doesn't need to get that deep of an understanding of the framework, right? Yeah. The product, the CSPO is, is fully, is completely enough. But then having the Scrum Master support this collaborative effort on building those things and building that shared understanding. But, but I don't go deeper than that. I don't teach. Yeah more collaboration skills than that. I think I could emph emphasize more on the aspect of, although the product owner is just one person and there's a good reason for that, right? Getting to faster decisions and not having like these constant debates, it, but that it's still a team sport. And that team is a combination of the people in the scrum team, the developers, but also their, their main stakeholders. and. Yeah. And yeah, I think I, I think that would make a lot of sense. It has to be because if you look at what people like you um, and and I are saying a product owner should do around the strategy, the business model, understanding the, the channels through which you, the whole business model, right? Understanding your markets, understanding your competitors. That's a lot of work, um, a lot of continuous work, right? So also you're you're engaged with continuous product discovery. So. Of course, you can't do all of that and answer every single question for the team. So if you've got strong product designers, UX designers, engineers, they, you can delegate lots of the tactical stuff. Like why do you need to ask a product owner what the UX should be when you have a UX specialist on the team? Like, I ask that person. They're trained in that. I'm not. I, and, and the product design, like, so I think that actually one of the biggest problems that prevents product owners doing the strategic stuff 
is we've for years told them they need to support the team with every little decision about what to just like you don't need to do that. And the more, as you say, um, involved the developers, I can't stop calling them the development team, the developers oh, are yeah. in, uh, in that process, the more context they understand of the customer, the more they can make great decisions on their own and you can be strategic right and, and uh, for me you know product owners not making these low level decisions like the team is you are being much more strategic and, that, and that's these tools that we're talking about here and as such you can only get to that point through the kind of collaboration you mentioned yeah now both of us also teach the cal and i know that in your agile leadership course certified agile leadership course short cal you also have the leadership agility model from Bill yeah. Joyner and Stephen Josephs as, you, as your foundations. Now, what I love about that model is, and the way I interpret it, like different people, again, interpret it in a different manner, is that all three types of leadership are valid depending on the context. So you can act as an expert, which means a lot of centralized decisions if the context demands it. And that's usually if time is critical and a lot of other people don't have the knowledge and experience that you have. So your decisions become relevant. You can act as an achiever, which is you set out goals and others figure out how to achieve those goals. And you can act as a catalyst, which is you mainly become the person that helps others as a group or individuals take good decisions by themselves, which is more decentralized decisions. Now, while you were talking about the role of a product owner, this is one of the other aspects that I do share in the classes, a product owner can live that leadership agility as well. Mm -hmm. There might be elements where you actually make all the, make the decisions because everyone else in the team is like lacking the context or whatever. You act as an expert. There might be elements where you act as an achiever, but ideally you want to spend more and more and more of your time as a product owner working as a catalyst, enabling others to take those nitty gritty decisions in terms of making the product a great product from a user experience perspective, from a develop, like performance perspective, all of these things. Now, in our leadership course, and I've been in yours and uh, I, I also teach that is as a leader, you need to spend a certain amount of time to creating that foundation, like giving people the context, building, having, helping them build the capabilities so that you can delegate more and more and more decisions towards them. Yeah. That will probably also be true for a product owner, right? The leadership role, right? And it's just yeah. like any other leadership role, those models are, are valid. And, and but the, as, the, as the product becomes more complex and the, the context becomes more volatile and uncertain, then the more you have to lean on that type of behavior because no, no one person can have that the cognitive capacity, the knowledge of everything going on at the same time, or the sheer physical presence to be everywhere to make those decisions like an expert would, right? And then so you know, for a really simple product in a really slow moving environment, sure, you can be the, the decision maker. Right? And I think, you know, lots of people see, and I've read a lot of biographies of Steve Jobs, right? Lots of people see that kind of character and they think he was this dictator who made all the decisions. Steve Jobs surrounded himself with incredibly talented people who he allowed and empowered to do great things. Steve Jobs did not design this, right? It was largely Johnny Ive and, and others, right? And he has a very strong vision, but he didn't do the doing. And I think the people mistake his personality with, you need to be there to make all the decisions. It's like, you can't, because even he's not that good. Even Elon Musk's not that good, right? They, like whoever big your brain is, it's not big enough to be yeah. bigger than the whole team collaborating together. And even if it were, you mentioned like the, <clears throat> the, 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 the physics, like the time constraint. We all have the same amount of time. Yeah. Now imagine how could Elon Musk manage SpaceX, Tesla, now Twitter and a few other companies, right? Just physically being present. If he would want to take all the decisions, it could, he could do it, but all of those companies would have one characteristic. They would be slow. Yeah. Now, none of the Musk companies is known for being slow. They're actually known for being incredibly fast. And, and I think this is <clears throat> one of the things that a lot of people get wrong, as you mentioned, ask, thinking that the product owner should be the person in charge of all the decisions. Yeah. Whereas if they set out, and that brings us back to the topic of strategy, 
If they make those important decisions and create a shared understanding around the strategy, and Marty Kagan, to some extent, talks about strategy, mostly he talks about product principles that then also help to make those day-to-day decisions. If those things are clear, more and more of the day-to-day decisions that today many of the product owners take would be decentralized and it won't go to the developers or the development team, how both of you and I struggle to not call them any longer. <laughs> the developers, um, I think you're, you're right. Product principles, it, I don't know whether it was in Marty Kagan who said it or somebody else. I don't know, I read so many books on these things, but they talk about eBay, right? And the, the product principle is like, look, you've got a two-sided marketplace there. You've got sellers and you've got buyers. Ultimately, you have to prioritize one over the other. So who's it going to be? And if memory serves, the overarching product principle is to prioritize buyers, right? Because right. Without, exactly. without buyers, the, the sellers won't come. So if you've got buyers, the sellers will come. But whereas if you if you prioritize sellers, which is I think what Uber does, by the way, it prioritizes drivers over riders. It's like, well, we just get fed up when we go somewhere else, right? And I don't know that they do that. I sense that they do that. Um, so, but with strong principles around a strong strategy, if there's alignment, this just goes back to what David Marquet says, right? You know, technical competence uh, and organizational clarity. Uh, and, and then you can decentralize decision making. But the strategy and the principles are that organizational clarity, that alignment that you need in the product space. It's vital. Otherwise, you have to keep all the decisions. You're right. Yeah. Now, to the, to the things that David Marquette mentions, like the organizational context or clarity and the technical competence, being able to do that, I always add a third thing. If it's about decision making, people also need to have the courage to take those decisions. Yeah, I think because you can have both organization clarity and technical competence. But if you're not courageous enough or if you're afraid of making uh, mistakes, you don't take decisions and then nothing moves forward. That is. um, So, yeah. So so the, the model I use, I actually put trust, transparency and psychological safety as the foundation, which I think allows people to be courageous. Then, of course, you need the tools. But but another thing is you need aligned incentives too, right? Because like, there's so many organizations, it's what's right for me and what's right for the product or the team are not the same thing. So once you get those, there are many more things you need to put in place too. But, but those things, absolutely, the culture to be able to run an experiment and to fail and to recover is vital. Or of course, I don't want to make the decision because then, then I'm the one on the line if it doesn't work out and I'm going to protect my my job right so again it's the leader's job product owner and hire to create that that foundation inside which we can do all of this stuff and this is why business agility innovation product management all fit together by the way right because they, there's they are they are just multiple threads that are all tangled up and you can't just focus on one thing without impacting all of the others it's really interesting yeah, in your book, the six enablers shows that shows that really well. Which we will, by the way, link in the in the notes of this of this uh, podcast, video cast, what, whatever we want to call this. Now, I think we identified or discussed at least you and I. And I don't know whether other people will reach to the same conclusion. How important that strategy is, and how we distinguish between a strategy and the product goal, and. Still, right, even if we have a product goal, the strategy needs to be implemented early on. And based on the strategy, we'll probably get to some product principles that help us or help everyone make the decisions on a day-to-day basis. Why do you think is there this, or what, what do you think is the reason that so few organizations, at least the ones that I've worked with, probably you have worked with, and so few product owners, are aware of this and can actually do this on the level that is necessary for the product and ultimately the organization to succeed? Because it's hard, right? Um, so, you know, actually, it's not rocket science, understanding the frameworks, but actually making the tough choices is really hard. It's about saying, I'm going to serve this market and not serve this market, right? This customer segment in this location. Right. And and let's say you even know who your customer segments are. Right. You're going to be right. OK, I need a competitive advantage, whether you choose cost leadership or differentiation. Let's say you choose differentiation because it's more fun. Right. Um, what are my sources of differentiation? What makes my product s- sustainably 
better than everyone else's product? And how can I build a moat around that so others can't just copy what we do and we can have a sustainable competitive advantage? That's really, really difficult, that thought process. And validating that thought process with, as Roger Martin would say, what would need to be true and then testing that those things not are true, could be true, right? Because strategy isn't about getting data about the past, as, as you know. It's about envisaging what could be in the future. That takes imagination, that takes storytelling, that takes metaphor, but that also takes systematic testing of your assumptions like we would for any part of our product. And those things are really hard to do, and they're really not aligned with most organizational cultures, which are very bureaucratic about it's about analysis and getting it right and executing. It's like, no, actually, this is an experimental process, a, a one of imagination, not one of engineering. Um, and, and so people just find it very difficult to do, and therefore they don't take the tough decisions. They just carry on as they are, which may be the right thing to do, but it may not. Yeah. No, I, I, I fully agree with that. What, what I also see is, I mean, you have worked in organizations, I've worked in organizations where they had this huge, like, really long-term planning going into the future, also called as like waterfall approach, right? Yeah. Now, even in, in the waterfall context, I don't think they did the strategy piece particularly well. They usually just spent a lot of time defining what that specific product should be doing, right? Yeah. The features of the product without having a clear strategy. But when the pendulum swing more and more towards like agility and fast feedback loops and like delivering in shorter cycles, I think people even more forgot about those thought exercises because everything you just laid out is first and foremost, until you get to validating your assumptions, right? Testing business ideas. But until then, it's all a thought exercise. Yeah. They forgot about all of those things because that's not agile anymore, right? We're not building anything. We're not giving or putting anything into our customers' hands. What are we going to get feedback based on, right? And Scrum says we need to have a potentially shippable product increment at the end of a sprint, and a sprint can't be longer than a month or four weeks or whatever. And I think that's also one of the things where a lot of the people in our community, right, in the, yeah. in the agile community, the trainers community, many of them have never heard or ever done something like a strategy. And therefore, it's difficult to create the awareness for it. And based on the awareness, then go yeah. and teach people and help them actually do this really well. How do you see that? You don't encounter this stuff. Right? And that's why, you know, so many people came up to me after that talk and said, I've never seen these tools, right? And these, you know, some of the tools I showed were, were, were Michael Porter's you know, tools from his book, Competitive Strategy, which was written in 1985 when I was five years old, right? It, this isn't new stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, Roger Martin's work is newer, but it's not new, right? When did his book with, uh, when, did, when did Playing to Win come out? It was like four or five years ago now, right? Even I think more. 2013 or something like that. So not, a new, not a new concept, yeah. right? And, and a lot of the stuff from Blue Ocean Strategy has been around just as long. Um, so you don't tend to learn this stuff unless you go to business school, right? Or unless you go and work in a, a big consult, a big strategy consultancy. I, I certainly went deep into it in business school, as I imagine did you. And when you were at Bain, you probably went even deeper, right? Um, but, but this stuff, I want to pick up on what you said about you know, this is an agile, right? Thinking like doing this upfront thinking and having a strategy. Like we can't have a strategy. Everything's changing. Yet yeah, things are changing. You're right. But the fact that Let's take um, Henry Ford, right? Hey, I'm going to sell my Model T. My strategy is to make it as cheap as possible. And off the back of that, we're going to have one color. We're going to have one model. We're not going to let you customize it. We're going to put the moving production line in. It's like, well, well, that stuff doesn't change. Even if the world changes, you might tweak the, the car slightly, but the strategy doesn't change. Just like Rolls-Royce saying, hey, you can customize it as much as you like, and we're going to go super high end. That doesn't change. That's still their strategy. Even if the products and services underneath it do change and evolve, you're still ultimately competing on a differentiation strategy. Apple's strategy hasn't changed. I mean, its business model has evolved, but its strategy is we're going to create the best products we can and continually innovate. And to do that, we're going to have our own in-house operating system. We're going to hire the best designers, the best UX. That's their strategy, and it doesn't change, really. Right? They're unlikely to say, you know what, guys? 
we're now going to be the cheapest. Turn it all around. We're just going to outsource our operating system to a cheaper place. They're not going to do that. So these tough choices that are made, if you make them well, they can last a long time and you're agile with the products and services, the business models and the features within that strategy. The strategy remains intact. I think this is what a lot of the agilists don't get their head around. It's like you can have things that are long, long term and, and, un, and, and unchanging, not forever, but, but, but they do endure a lot longer than your product or services or any feature set do. Um, so I think we need to separate the strategy from the product value proposition and even from the business model. Yeah. And, and I think this is like going back to another one of these great thought leaders, Jim Collins. In one of his books, he refers to the genius of the end. So you can be long term while also delivering short term. Yeah. It's not one or the other. And you mentioned that the strategy doesn't change. And one of the people that I found like put this really well is uh, they, they talk, they asked Jeff Bezos several times, right? How does he come up with strategy? And he always says he focuses on the trends that don't change. Because so many businesses are looking at, okay, oh, we're going to have AI and we're going to have this. And like all of those things that are going to change, right? How can we set out a strategy to deal with that? He says, let's focus on those things that don't change. Customers want a bigger selection. Customers want lower prices. And customers want products faster, right? Yeah. These three things are probably never going to change. You're not going to see a customer who says, no, 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 I actually want to go back to communist Russia because I don't want to have a big selection, right? <laughs> Or I want to have a very inefficient supply chain that when I order stuff, it comes two weeks later. Yeah. No, we always want it faster. And no one's going to say, I want things to be more expensive, right? There are some people who say, oh, tax us, right? We like to pay more taxes, but no one wants to pay more stuff for the stuff that they bought. Pay more nobody, money for nobody the wants a worse user experience on the website, right? A um, worse user experience, you, right? You, so you, you, remind me, things. you remind me of a, of a story, and I know you'll know this story because you've read the same book. Um, but it's uh, it, it's when when um, Amazon were trying to move into the digital space, right? Amazon Amazon Digital. It's like, well, what is our competitive advantage as Amazon? It's like the things you mentioned, the the breadth of choice. I can buy almost anything on Amazon. Amazon's my go-to place. If I need something, I'm just going to look on Amazon. Don't even Google it now. I look on Amazon, right? Um, and the the price probably, and also the the, the distribution. I have Amazon Prime. If it's on Prime, it will get to me tomorrow. For, for free, right? So that is almost impossible for anyone to compete with. When you're talking about selling eBooks, it goes away because I can host as many eBooks I like in the cloud and I can get the eBook to you like that without a distribution center. It's like, so wait, my competitive advantage is just gone as Amazon when I'm selling eBooks. So they went through the thought process of how can we have a competitive advantage? This is strategic thinking. This is the kind of strategic thinking they go through. And they went, all right, well, you need to control Either the, the content creation, a bit like Netflix, right, makes its own original film, movies and, and TV shows like House of Cards, but they didn't want to start becoming a publisher, or you control the, the channel through which people consume that. And at the time, people were consuming their eBooks through like computers, right, through laptops and PCs. It's like, well, uh, Apple just made a device where you, people can download music and play that. Why don't we make a device where we can download books and read that? Yeah, it's called the Kindle. It went very well, and it made them sell hundreds of millions more books, right? But that was a process of strategic thinking that resulted in let's build the Kindle. Now, of course, they tested their assumptions. They built it. It was incredibly successful. That's what we're not doing with so many products these days, right? And that's what Jeff Bezos does so well. So you just reminded me of that with that story. And they, they yeah. talk about this in Working Backwards, right? Another of the authors you've interviewed. Yeah, Colin, Colin Breyer and, and, and Bill Carr, yeah. I mean, that, that's exactly the thing, right? What are the things, what are the factors that are not going to change? What is going to be my strategy on a certain level about things that, like things that I'm going to really work on in the next five, maybe even 10 years, where to play, how to win. And based on that, then go into your day-to-day -day decisions, but have the agility, both in terms of assessing the, the assumptions behind your strategy. You mentioned like what would have to be true. That's the question when we come up with a strategy and in terms of the details, the products that you're building, the value propositions that we're creating, there we need to have this real agility, the speed of 
coming up with something, giving it into the hands of certain customers, if not all. Apple doesn't give it to all customers. They always have some secret way of testing things and then ultimately create better products yeah. that, that, that serve our company, but especially our customers really well. So, um, Karim, with the sake, with regards to time, um, are there any final thoughts that you have around the topic of product strategy? Maybe things that you covered in your talks, but you and I didn't get to have a conversation about. Um, it's not really about strategy. It's the story I told um, at the start. Right? Um, um, there was a, a famous experiment that, that was done by uh, Professor Georgi Gauss, and, and I'm probably saying that wrong, right? Uh, I think he was Russian. Georgi Gauss in 1934. He put these uh, single cell organisms in a pot with some food and he tracked the, the, the amount of multiplication that happened over time. And it just went like this over, over 20 days. He then did it again with a different, similar, uh, same, same genus, but different species. Um, and he went bing, 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 over time. Then he put the two of them in together. What do you think happened when he put the two of them in together? It depends on the organisms. Yeah. One of them really thrived. Yeah. And the other didn't. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Because one was living off the other to some extent. One thrived, one died out. Now, th th this is like the, the, the competitive exclusion theory. This is like no, no two species can, when you live in the same area and need the same resources, can both thrive. One will always have a slight competitive advantage over the other and ultimately drive it to extinction. And I started with this story, right? Because this is true in business. You remember Betamax uh, versus VHS, right? Um, slight competitive advantage for one, it drove it into the ground. So two products cannot exist in the same space competing for the same customers, the same customer segments with a similar value proposition and both survive. You have to find a space where you can win. And, and actually it's quite interesting because there's a certain species of lizards that live in, in certain countries that actually some live in the trees and some live on the ground and therefore they don't compete. And actually some live uh, in one side of the island and some live on the other and therefore they can coexist. But if you're targeting the same customers for the same product, one of you will win and one of you will lose and you'll lose big. So you know, the, you know, the, the overarching principle here is if you can't, be the best in this space, find a different space. Find a space where you can be the best because if you're not the best, you will be destroyed. And you might say, oh, there are lots of different car companies, but they're playing different games in different markets, right? The Rolls Royce is targeting different customers to Ford, who's targeting different customers to Tesla. Um, as soon as you are looking for the same resources in the same part of the world, one of you is going to win and one of you is going to lose. And, and so if you get that mindset, of, you know, if I'm going up against this person, I need to be very clear about why I'm better or I need to go somewhere else. I think that frames a lot of decision making really, really well. And I really liked that analogy with strategy. It's like that's exactly how it works in business, too. Yeah. I mean, with, with regards to company, car companies, before Tesla was there, the market, yeah, they were like changing different uh, like positions in terms of like who sold the most cars. But especially the German car companies, they were all more or less settled. And then Tesla swoops in and completely changes the game yeah. at a pace that has been unseen before. And yeah. that's where a lot of these companies now really, really struggle. So they have to um, think hard how they can get out of that. They played a completely different game, right? Completely yeah. different game. Um, and it's, <laughs> they've done it very successfully. So much so that now everyone's trying to move on to their turf. It's like, well, yeah, but can you do it as well as them? And, and, and actually, yeah. you know, sometimes your competitive advantage is your brand, right? So companies like Porsche, they'll probably be all right because you buy a Porsche because you want a Porsche, right? Sometimes um, your competitive advantage is your product. And so when a better product comes along, that's when you're in trouble, right? So I think we'll see some companies survive and some disappear. Yeah, but with the brand thing, it also only takes you so far. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Because at some point, if the other offering is so much better it really becomes difficult to just compete based on your brand. Long term, yeah. And, and when the others now try to enter the turf that te or the niche that Tesla created, they really have to, as you mentioned, right? they have to ask themselves, how are we going to compete? What is going to be our value proposition? And how are we going to bring this value proposition to market fairly quickly? Because none of them is as vertically integrated and that's then part of the strategy, right? You mentioned this about Apple. It's very similar with Tesla. 
And sometimes, now maybe a side story. Yesterday, uh, I spent an hour watching the latest interview with Elon Musk. It was run by Baron Capital, one of the big investors in Tesla. And there he talked about how the strategy of vertical integration started in the first place. None of the major suppliers to automotive companies wanted to take a bet on Tesla because there wasn't a successful car startup in the past century, basically, right? Yeah. So they said, all right, we have to do all of these things ourselves because no one is going to supply us with these parts. But then being vertically integrated more, much more than the others gives them now so much more speed in terms of building products, delivering those products to customers and so on and so forth. So sometimes like having a curse or the necessity to reinvent yourself or invent in a specific areas can in the long run be of a great benefit. And Tesla is probably another great example where Elon Musk early on set out his strategy, right? With the master plan one, the two, and then number three is probably coming out shortly. Yeah, yeah, I, those constraints can make you be creative, right? Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, yeah, I love this stuff. I think, I think for me, the takeaway is this, right? Know, know where you're going to play, your, your, your markets, your customer segments you're going to target. Understand at a high level how you will source your competitive advantage. Will you be cheaper than everyone else? and find a way to create your products such that you can be, or will you be better? And if you're better, what are going to be your sources of competitive advantage? And are they sustainable in that can people copy them? If you go through that process of thinking and then you come out with your product in alignment with that, it's like you'll be unstoppable if you do it well. Uh, so really that's what I want product owners to focus on. The backlog is just the end part of that thinking process, right? Once you've gone exactly. you through it. Um, so it's really important we don't ignore it. and. Uh, uh, doing my bit to try and spread the word as I know are you. Yeah, cool. Karim, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, man. That was fun. Yo, bye. Take it easy.